Okay, the Torah portion today is called what? Which means what? But it's all about her death. <laughs> Here it's, it's called the life of Sarah, but actually it focuses on the death of Sarah. Now, I want to show you something that's quite fascinating. The subtitle is Abeka for Rebecca. What's interesting, you'll notice going from right to left, Rebecca is spelled with the bait, the cough, and the hay, but a Becca is a bait, a cough, and an eyeing. What is the significance of this? A Becca is something that has been cut in half, like a half a shekel. But we're going to look at this more in a little bit. It is profound. But for now, let's look. Uh, well, let me say this. You know, I think this is also something else that's important. Who else dies in this chapter? Or at this Torah portion? Abraham, of all people. Why is this called Chai Abraham? Sarah seems to be more important than Abraham. And I think uh, it's very important that we also understand just how important Sarah was, that this is known as the life of Sarah. Well, let's take a look, because this is something that's quite fascinating. Uh, I have here circled, you see, Jerusalem, and then Hebron, and then Beersheba is at the bottom. Well, let's begin with Genesis 20, verse 1 and 2. The Torah portion begins with Genesis 23, but I want to set everything up here. Okay, it says, Abraham journeyed from there to the south country, and he dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and then it says he sojourned in Gerar. All right, so let's come to this picture. I have again Jerusalem, Mamre, which is Hebron, and Beersheba, but that's Gerar, which is right next to the Gaza Strip. So he's in the south country, and that's where they dwelt. So let's move them over to Gerar. Okay, they're in Gerar. Now let's watch what happens. It says, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, well, she's my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. All right. Now, Abraham was a little chicken about some things. And uh, he claimed that she was her sister. And Abimelech found out that ain't true. This is the same Abimelech when Isaac did the same thing with Rebekah. He did the very same thing. But look at this. After that, he settles up with Abimelech, and then it says, so Abraham returned to uh, his young men. Okay, this is where, let's watch this. Remember the Akedah where uh, Isaac is offered up. Okay, well, here's what happens. They go to Beersheba, and then Abraham decides to go offer up Isaac in Jerusalem out Mount Moriah. Now, if you were Sarah, you were 90 years old and never able to get pregnant. And then finally you have a son and you've had him for about 30 years. He was like 30 years old when uh, Abraham was offering up. He wasn't a young kid. As the mother of Isaac, what would you think of your husband's <laughs> kill? <laughs> That's probably. So she wasn't happy. So look at this. Abraham returns to his young men after he attempted to raise up, uh, after he tried to kill Isaac. And they rose up and went together to where? Beersheba. Abraham lived at where? Beersheba. We don't hear about Isaac going with Abraham and the young men. We just hear Abraham went with the two young men back home to Beersheba. We don't hear of Isaac. Isaac disappears from the story. And Isaac is a type of who? The Messiah, right? Isaac disappears, and he, we don't see Isaac return until he comes to get his bride. Isn't that fascinating? But watch what happens here. So what happens? Sarah goes to Hebron. Abraham comes back to Beersheba, and Sarah is gone. She left him. That's why when Sarah dies, Abraham goes to bury her because they separated their marriage. They separated. And so now Abraham has to go to Hebron where Sarah died. 
her last time was without Abraham. Look at this, Genesis 23, 1 and 2. This is the beginning of our Torah portion. Sarah lived 127 years. This was the length of Sarah's life. Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, which is the same as Hebron, the land of Canaan. And then Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He wasn't there. He was in Beersheba. And he had to go and mourn for her. So Abraham was 137 when Sarah dies. Because she was 127, 10 years difference. So Isaac would have been 37 when his mother dies. And then he mourns for three years. And in Genesis 25, 20, we see Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. So he was 37 uh, when he was about to be offered up. Okay, now. Let's look at Genesis 14, 13. We're going to go back a little bit again to set a foundation of things. Look at Genesis 14, 13. There came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. Now, remember I showed you that Mamre is also Hebron, right? Look at this. Mamre is a person. Mamre is an Amorite. So the city, all these cities back then were named after the founders. So Mamre, the Amorite, who's the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. So we see the Amorites, who were pagan Canaanites, them and Abram were confederates. They were friends, all right? So who controls Hebron? The Amorites control Hebron. But guess what happened? There was a big war. And let's look at what happens. Uh, Genesis 23, 3 and 4. Abraham stood up from before his dead and he spoke to the sons of Het. The Het is the Hittites. How many of you heard of the Hittites? The Hittites went to war with the, Mar uh, with the Amorites and took over Hebron. So here he's about to buy the cave of Machpelah for a burying place for Sarah and the rest of the family. But instead of buying it from his friends, the Amorites, who just lost the battle, he's buying it from the Hittites, who just got it by war, and they're ripping them off, selling it for such an exorbitant price that they didn't even have to pay for it. It wasn't even their land. They just basically stole it or conquered it from the Amorites. And so he says to the sons of Het, I am a stranger and a sojourner. With you, give me a possession of a burial plot with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now look at Hebrews eleven thirteen. In faith, all of these died, not having received the promise, but from afar having seen them, having been persuaded, having saluted them, having confessed that they were what? Strangers and sojourners on the earth. How many of you realize you are strangers and sojourners on this earth? This earth is not reality. Yes, it's reality to us, but it's not the real reality. Does that make sense? The problem is we get so consumed with this world, we see this as reality. It isn't. Now, Abraham was considered a stranger and a foreigner among the Gentiles. But guess what? Those Gentiles who come to the faith of Abraham are no longer to be considered as strangers and foreigners to the God of Abraham. Look at Genesis 23, 7. Well, Ephesians 2, 19, it says, Therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. Okay, so we might think as non-Jews we're strangers and foreigners, but God says, no, in this real reality, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. I like the new reality. Okay, now look at Genesis 23, 7. Abraham stood up and he bowed or prostrated himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Het. You know what? The root word of Het is? The Hittites mean terrorists. Literally. The terrorists. He's Bowing down before the terrorists. There's the one who took over from the Amorites. Now, 
Let's look at Genesis 23, 10 through 16. Do you guys have the Hebrew on your notes? Do you see the little Hebrew for the word name Ephron? Okay, I have it up on the screen. It's Ephron the Hittite. Okay. That's how you spell his name. But I want you to watch. It says, and Ephron, you notice how it's spelled just like I have it on the screen? Dwelt among the children of Het, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Het, even of all that went at the gate of his city. Why is it important that they're at the gate of the city? That's where the judges and the leaders are. And if you're going to pay for a piece of real estate back then, you better make sure when you buy that real estate, everyone knows you bought it. That's why this is being done at the gate of the city. And Ephron says, oh, no, my Lord, hear me. The field, I'm giving it to you. In the cave that is there, I give it to you. In the presence of the sons of my people, give I to you. Bury your dead. Well, that sounds pretty good. But if you find out in the deal, you don't get the treats. You don't get anything else. Oh, because Abraham is trying to, they had crooked real estate people back then too. Okay? And whenever someone says, I give something to you, it's like, okay, what's the backside of this? And it, it says here, Abraham bowed himself before the people. Now he's doing it before everybody. And he spoke to Ephron in the audience of the people of the land saying, but if you give it to me, I pray you, hear me, I'll give you money. So, okay, we're both selling it, but we're both trying to look like we're generous. So you give me that, fine, I will give you money for what? The field. That means I want the trees, I want everything that is in this field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead. But Ephron answered Abraham, and he said, oh, my Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between me and you? Bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. When it says listen, he meant he was listening to the tone. He was hearing what he was really saying. That's why it says he listened. And then he says, um, uh, Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Het, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. But look at the last time Ephron is in Hebrew. It's not spelled the same. Look at my screen. It's all of a sudden, that last vav is missing, and it's spelled Ephron. Now, you're not going to see this in English, because they don't erase the O in Ephron's name in English. But in Hebrew, it is intentionally misspelled. Why? Because the vav represents a connection. It's the word end in Hebrew, this and that. It's connecting two things. Also, the vav is the number six. Man was created on the sixth day. So vav represents man. Vav connects things. The Vav was removed from Ephron's name. He lost his connection to God, and he became less of a man because of how he ripped off Abraham. But you're not going to see this in English. You're only going to see this in Hebrew. So Ephron's name was reduced by God on account of his greedy attitude. His pocketbook was made larger, but his name was made smaller, which is worth more. Now, I've been to Hebron several times, these are the actual steps that Abraham walked on to go to the city gate of Hebron. This is in Hebron. These are the actual steps that he walked on to the city gate. They are still there. Okay, now let's go to Genesis 2, 24, I mean, verse 3 and 4. Abraham doesn't want his son Isaac to marry any of the Canaanites. And so he says to Eliezer, I'm going to make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. I want you to go to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife to my son Isaac. Uh, why is that? Why does he not want to have him marry a Canaanite? Well, look at the next verse. Canaan was cursed. And he said, cursed be Canaan in Genesis 9. A servant of servants, he'll be, able, uh, he'll be to his brothers. 
And he said, blessed be the God of Shem, and Canaan will be his servant. God will enlarge Japheth, and he will dwell in the tents of Shem, but Canaan will be his servant. So he does not want, it's just like going back to where, I think it's 2 Corinthians 6, 14, I could be wrong, but it says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That, the, the Canaanites were the unbelievers. That's why he says, I, I want to have, I want Isaac to be married to a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then uh, here we go. We now have the picture of Eliezer trying to see if Rebecca is the right one for Isaac. And it says he made his camels uh, to kneel down outside the city by a well of water at the time of the evening. This is like 3 p.m. It's a time when women go to draw out the water. And the Eliezer said, oh, Lord, God of my master, Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master, Abraham. Do you know this is the very, very first recorded individual petitionary prayer in the Bible? This is the first prayer in the Bible. Anyone can petition God. Eliezer wasn't Jewish. He's a Gentile. And it's also, we find it's the best place to find a wife is the local watering hole. All right. Now, let's go to Genesis 24, 14. He says, let the young woman to whom I will say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And they'll say, drink and I'll water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this, I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Well, the chief criterion that he had for finding a wife was if she was kind and if she cared for animals. For many people, when looking for a spouse, a friend, a business partner, they look for brains, wealth, if they're famous, powerful. But the Torah says kindness or goodness is the greatest trait. Isn't that amazing? And so here we go. Genesis 24, 17 through 20. The servant ran. ran. He, just remember, what did Abraham do? He ran. He hurried. And here his disciple ran to meet her. And he said, let me, I pray you, drink a little water. How much did he want? A little water out of your pitcher. And she said, drink, my Lord. And then what did she do? She hurried and let down her pitcher on her hand, gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I'm going to draw water for your camels also until they're done drinking. And she hurried and emptied her pitcher into the trough. And she ran again to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. She's acting just like Abraham. He ran. He hurried. He was kind to others. He was a servant to others. People were his priority. Well, guess what? Here you go. She only spoke once. But she took, there were 11 action verbs. She spoke once, but she did a lot. How often do people talk a lot and do nothing? Well, here, what do we see? She says very little, and then, wow, she's full of action. Do you know, now this is going to be a shock. There are more laws in the Torah about caring for animals than there are in how to keep the Shabbat. There's a whole lot more laws about how to care for animals than there is in how to keep the Shabbat. And you know people have psychological problems when they hate cats, dogs, want to run over them. You know what I mean? I mean, it's okay if you don't like cats or dogs. But I'm just saying there are some people who could care less about the animals, a life. They don't see that. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 25.4, it says don't muzzle the ox. Exodus 20.10, animals get to rest on the Sabbath. Deuteronomy 22.6, uh, taking care of the mother bird. Okay, there's a lot more laws on caring for animals. But now get a load of this. He had 10 camels, all right? I'm going to give you some facts. A camel drinks 15 gallons of water in 10 minutes. So that's three five-gallon buckets, okay? Now... If you have three five-gallon buckets of water per camel, 10 camels, that's 35-gallon buckets of water. 
Five gallons of water weigh 42 pounds. So she's hauling 126 pounds per camel and 1,260 pounds for all of them. That's amazing. Well, let's look at Exodus 30, verse 12 and 13. This is also important. It says, when you are taking the number of the children of Israel. All right. When is this supposed to be over, Jill? <laughs> what? Well, how come it says 1039 on this screen up here? <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. It says, when you're taking the number of the children of Israel, let everyone who is numbered give to the Lord a price for his life. Wow. It says, so no disease may come on them when they're numbered. And this is what they are to give. Let every man who is numbered give what? A half a shekel. Okay, now we'll look at the screen. Half a shekel is makatsit ha shekel. And you can see that going this way, makatsit. Ha the shekel, half shekel. That's what the word for half a shekel is that is always used, but twice in the Torah. But right here, watch what happens. In Genesis 24, 22, which is our next verse, it came to pass as the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden earring of what? Half a shekel. Now, you would think that's what it would be, but it's not. It is this, a Becca. He's giving a Becca for Rebecca, all right? And what it means, a half a shekel, on the previous screen, let me go back. I just have a half a shekel coin that says half a shekel. But the actual is something that's been broken in two. It means to cleave. To be broken. That's what a becca is. So it's half of a full shekel that's been broken, not a shekel with a half on it. Is anyone following me? Okay. Now, watch this. Uh, it was two bracelets he gave for her hands of 10 shekels weight of gold. Well, look at this. We know there were two tablets with 10 commandments that were broken. Look at Exodus 32, 19. It came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp, he saw the calf, the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them beneath the mount. So here she was given two bracelets symbolizing the two tablets. Okay, 10 shekels weight of gold. This is referring to the commandments. As a matter of fact, look at Psalm 119, 72. The Torah of your mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. So here, now watch this. It says, the future bride of Isaac receives a gold earring of one becca. One becca is a half a shekel. This word only appears twice in the Torah. And whenever a Hebrew word only appears twice, they're connected. Okay, this is what the, how the Jews study. They see something's mentioned twice, there's a connection. What is the connection? Well, Becca means to cleave or be broken. Let's go to Exodus 38, 25 and 26. Going back to when they had to give half a shekel. The silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents, a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And it says, a becca ahead. So this time, the word becca means half a shekel, but they're using the word becca, okay, which is half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary, for every one that passed over to them that were numbered from 20 years old and upward for 600,000 and 3,550 men. Okay, well, here is the deal. It says a becca, a what? A head. Well, guess what? The Hebrew word for head is golgalet, where we get Golgotha from, where someone was broken and so he could receive his bride. We have the half a shekel, and he is broken. It's like at the cross. 
and he was broken. So here the becca is given to the bride, and now the bride gives a becca to the groom. It's like the two rings being married. That's what it comes down to. And Messiah had a broken heart over his bride. Look at Matthew 27, 33. When they came to the place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull. Or one, Becca Gulgalet, which means this was for the building of the sanctuary. It could also be translated as one who will be broken at Golgotha. And that's in the Exodus. One who is going to be broken at Golgotha. Well, Messiah is the one broken at Golgotha to pay the redemption price so he can take his bride to himself. He is both halves of the shekel. The golden half speaking of his deity and the silver half speaking of his humanity. And after the story of the binding of Isaac or the command to offer up Isaac, we find Isaac isn't seen again until he meets his bride. Just like Messiah who's been broken, offered up and left, but he is coming back. So comparing these scriptures, we can see a connection between the one half of a shekel of gold being given in marriage by the groom and how it is tied to the other broken half, uh, the silver shekel, okay, which gives to him is the ransom or the dowry paid by the bride for the building of their home so the bride and groom could live together. Isn't this just mind-blowing? Okay, <clears throat> Genesis 25, 7 through 10. These... <clears throat> are the days of the years of Abraham's life. See, he dies in this Torah portion too. He was 175 years old, and Abraham gave up the ghost, and he died in a good old age. An old man full of years, he was gathered to his people, and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Het. There was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. Okay, how old is Ishmael and his brother Isaac at Abraham's death? Okay, if Abraham was 175, how old would Isaac be? 75, because he was 100 when he had him. How old would Ishmael be? He was 13 years older. He would be 88. Now, how old are Jacob and Esau when Abraham dies? They were 15 years old. <clears throat> Jacob and Esau were 15 Okay, now, <clears throat> considering next week's Torah portion, in Genesis 25, 20, we find Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian, to be his wife. Now, I just want to show you a couple of things here. <clears throat> I have a chart, and <clears throat> most of you may know, but I show every single Shemitah year in Jubilee year clear back to creation. It's all math. I can show you every and why we're in the Hebrew year we are in. But I took a section of that here, <clears throat> and we see that Moses entered, or not Moses, I'm sorry, Jacob and his 12 sons entered into Egypt in the year 2238, or they, entered, they left Egypt and went into the wilderness. In the year, or yeah, 2238, that, that's when they entered into Egypt when Joseph invited them all to come. That was the year 2238. In other words, it was 2,238 years since Adam was created. <clears throat> okay, right here, Noah dies in the year 2006 from Adam. Then we have the Tower of Babel story. Then in 2023, that is a Shemitah year when Abraham receives the promise to the promised land. And then in 2034, that's when Ishmael is born. And then Isaac is born, you see right here in the year 2048. That's when Isaac was born. <clears throat> Sarah dies. This is why I brought this up. This is our Torah portion. Sarah dies in the year 2085 from Adam and Eve. Okay, well then what? They get married. Yay. All right. So let's turn the lights on here. Yay. <clears throat> and then what happens? 2108 is the year of Jubilee. Now, let me explain. Every box here is a Shemitah cycle. And seven times seven is what? 
Okay, so after 49 years comes the year of Jubilee. So the first number in blue here is all years of Jubilee. The slash beta cycle of this one was 2107. And then we see now 2108. What do we see? It so happens Jacob was born in the year of Jubilee. And Jacob is known as Israel. All right. Well, here, we just talked about Abraham's death. He dies in the year 2123. Then we find Shem actually dies after Abraham. Shem lives so long. He dies in the year 2158. Isaac dies 10 years before they enter the prom, uh, the Egypt. Isaac dies in the year 2228. And then Jacob enters Egypt, and he's 130 years old, and it's the year uh, 2238 when Jacob and the family enters Egypt. But what's amazing, let me see what I got right. Okay. Jacob then dies in 2255, another year of Jubilee. Jacob or Israel literally is born in the year of Jubilee and dies in a year of Jubilee. And you're going to find that is so incredible when I go through these series that we're going through on Amalek. I'm going to share this with you. Uh, I think it might even be today. I'll have to look. But let's stand. And let's pray. Uh, then we'll have like a 15-minute break. Then we'll come back at 15 minutes of worship. Uh, and then I'll teach about the prophetic war that's coming with Amalek and when it will actually be. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything that you're revealing to us. We know it says in Deuteronomy that those hidden things from the Torah are revealed to us who want to keep your commandments. So, Father, I just pray you with, uh, instill within each and every one of us a strong desire to fulfill the commandments, to do what you ask because we love you, not out of fear of punishment, not out of hope of reward, but just because you're our dad and you've just asked us to be mindful of these things. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Okay, I'm going to put something up for two seconds, and I want everyone, I'm going to see how observant you are. Are you ready? Okay, watch closely. Okay, what did you see? Oh, oh wait, okay, I heard Starbucks and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, what? Nope. Arm and Hammer, well, guess what? They were all wrong. Oh, let me go, I'll show you again. It's KLC, Donkey Donuts, Arm and Hatchet, and let me go back, and uh, Sunbucks. Okay, those are all fake. All right? Well, we have to realize there is so much that we think is reality that isn't reality. It's fake. It's propaganda. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, going to rattle a lot of cages. But uh, this is the second part of a series. I'm actually going to do a three-part series. I'm going to finish it up next week. Last week, I, I began with Amalek. And I'm going to be talking about the war with Amalek, how it is actually written in the stars, written in the heavens. But that's going to be next week. If you look at Exodus 17, verse 16. Now, do you see this time clock up here on the screen? 
You see my little time clock right here that I got? Do you see the, the, all the gears inside? If there's a broken tooth, the clock ain't going to work. All right? Well, I'm going to be talking today about the coming war with Amalek, which is represented by Iran. It's like a, a vicious dog that goes after the elderly and the children. Uh, this refers to Amalek or Iran. Do you remember Haman, the story in the book of Esther? Haman was a Agagite. And 500 years earlier, Samuel was supposed to kill all of the Amalekites and the king, okay, was Agag. And he didn't. So 500 years later, here we have the book of Esther and we have Haman, all right, who is an Agagite. He is a direct descendant of Agag the king. That's why God said they needed to do what they needed to do. But here, look at Exodus 17, 16. It says, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. It says the Lord will have war, which means the Lord who is the one who initiates the battle. The Lord is the one who initiates the battle. But here's the thing. Whenever there are wars on earth, it's because there's a war that's going on in heaven. Just like Moses' tabernacle was patterned after the one in the heavens, the wars we see going on here are because there's wars going on in the heavens. Now, it says it's going to happen in every generation there will be an Amalek who wants to destroy Israel, which is why the Lord is always having war with Amalek. Well, I believe this generation's war with Amalek will occur the spring of 2024 through the spring of 2025 next year. And I'm going to tell you the reasons why. There's a couple of wars that haven't taken place yet. One of them is Isaiah 17. We're going to go over that. The other one is Psalm 83. Now, we know from Ecclesiastes 3.8, there's a time of what? And a time of peace. But if we think it's a time of peace, just like in Israel, they're going to be attacked and not realizing there's a war. Do you think they'd be doing that if they knew what was going to happen? No. This is why... It is important that we know what is coming over the next couple of years that I'll be speaking about next week. Uh, as I said, there are prophetic wars that are still to take place. The Psalm 83 war, the Isaiah 17, and I believe there will be a final war with Amalek. It'll be the final one because then the Messiah returns. Then there's the Ezekiel 38 and the Zechariah 12 through 14. Now, if you look at your notes... Psalms 83, 1 through 5. This is one of the wars yet to take place. It says, O God, don't keep quiet. Let your lips be open and take no rest, O God. And first look, those who make war on you are out of control. Your haters are lifting up their heads. They have made wise designs against your people, talking together against those whom you keep in a secret place. And look at what they've said. Come, let us put an end to them as a nation so that the name of Israel may go out of man's memory. For they have all come to an agreement. They are all joined together against you. Now, I saw an article uh, this last week where one of the Hamas leaders says our goal has been to eliminate Israel from the beginning. That is their goal. Now, look at the next verses. It says in Psalm 83, 6 to 8, these are the countries that want to wipe out Israel as a nation. The, <clears throat> the tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarines, those are the ones who came from Hagar, uh, Gebal, Ammon, and who else? Amalek, the Philistines, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Asher also is joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. So here you go. Here are the nations that it's talking about. I have up on the chart, Edom, Ammon, Moab, or all the nation of Jordan. Gebel and Tyre are Lebanon, Asher is Iraq, Philistines and Amalek are in Gaza, and the Hagarines, Ishmaelites is Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. 
Now, Isaiah 17 is another war that is coming. And look at it. It says, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city. And it will be a ruinous heap. Here's what's coming. Oh, the volume isn't on. But anyway, that is what is going to happen. And it is all over for Damascus. Okay, do it again. All right, let me go back. Here we go. It's not working. Oh, there it is. Here we go. Wasn't that fun? All right. Are we to know the times and seasons? Are we? Okay. If we know the time and the seasons, my question is, what time is it? What, what time is it? If we're supposed to know the times and seasons, well, here's the thing. What is the first question we should ask if we want to know the times and seasons is where? Where? There's, there's all different times around the world. So one question is, if we want to know what time it is, we ask, well, where do you want to know what time it is? Well, I want to know what time it is on the prophetic time clock. When, does that make sense? Well, here's the problem. This world is in its own time zone. They, I mean, we have all these time zones, all these gears are like different clocks, but this isn't the reality. Yes, it's the reality where we live, but the real question is, what time is it in the heavenly time clock? All right? And uh, here I have, I want you to understand when it says in Genesis 1.14, he made the sun and the moon for signs and then seasons. It's not winter, spring, summer, fall. The Hebrew word is moedim, and it means for the appointed times. The whole, they have uh, holy days, the weekly Shabbat, monthly the new moons, yearly all the festival years. When it says in Genesis 1.14, it's for days and months and years, it's referring to the new moons, the Shemitah year, the Jubilee year, not for the calendar that we are on here. Uh, and then in addition to the yearly Moedim, we've got the seventh year, the Shemitah year, the 50th year, the Jubilee year. That's the calendar we need to be on. For example, a lot of people ask me, well, how come uh, the, where are the missing 200 years on the Jewish calendar? Wrong question. Why have they added 200 years on the stupid Gregorian calendar? <laughs> what's the real and what's the fake? This is the correct biblical year, 5784 from Adam. The discrepancies aren't with the biblical calendar. It's with our stupid Gregorian calendar. And I will show you that today. First off, the moon. The Islamic calendar is based only on the moon. That's the lunar calendar. Okay? Do you think God is using that calendar? No. Well, then we have the solar calendar. Here we go. This is only solar. Okay, this happens to be Iran's calendar. That's solar. Do you think God is using that calendar? Well, guess what? It's no different than ours except the dressing. We have a calendar that's based only on the sun, just like Iran. It's solar only. All right? Look at this. The Julian calendar. Did you know in the year 1582, the Catholics said, we need to forget the Julian calendar and go to the Gregorian calendar. So in October... It went from Thursday the 4th to Friday the 15th. Wow, all of a sudden, this calendar, which you have the Gregorian calendar, they decided because everything was getting out of season, they had to correct it. Well, guess what? This is the Chinese calendar, which is a lunar solar calendar. So the one is only the moon. These bottom two are only the sun. But the Chinese calendar, even though it's lunar solar, that's not the one God is using to determine what happens prophetically. What is the common thing about all of these? They're man-made. That is the problem. Now, here we go. Beautiful picture of Noah. Look at Genesis 7, 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 
the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Let me show you the calendar we need to be on. It's called Anno Mundi or AM, not BC, AD or anything else. It's Anno Mundi, which means the year of the world. Anno is year, like annual. We get the word annual. Anno is, uh, these are Latin, and Mundi refers to earth or the world. So this is Latin of what year is it since creation? That's what the Bible is. Now think about this for a minute. Genesis 7, 11, God had already introduced a calendar. How would they know it, the second month? How would they know the seventh day of the month unless there was a calendar that was already in existence? And here we have it. It was in the year 1656 since creation, and it was on the 17th of Heshvan that Noah's flood took place. Now tell me, how in the world would anyone know that if there wasn't a calendar? Hello. Okay. So look at this. Here is year 1 a.m. of Adam and Eve. Now, I, I have this, but Seth was born when Adam was 130. This is what the Bible says. And then he gave birth to Enosh in the year 235. He beget Canaan, who beget Mahaliel, who beget Jared, who beget Enoch, and have the year of their birth on every single one of these little cakes. There's Methuselah, okay, uh, Lamech. And there's Noah. Noah was born in the year 1056. Okay, then Shem was born. Here comes the flood. And he was 600 years old. So it was in the year 1656. And then two years after the flood in 1658, he has Arphaxed. Okay, and then from there, you got all these little kids being born. Until we get to Terah, who gives birth to Abraham. And what year is it? 1948, the same year as Israel becomes a nation, is when Abraham is born. Wow, I wonder if that's a coincidence. He is 75 years old when he receives the covenant to the promised land, which is 2023. Okay, now... This is fascinating because we're in the year 2023. We're seeing patterns is what we have to watch. Okay, so Abraham receives the covenant 2023. Here we go. There it is, 2023. So we go to the next slide. Here is Abraham. He receives the covenant in 2023. Exodus 1241 says that Moses leaves the Egypt 430 years since the promise was given to him in 2023. You add 2023 to 430, you get 2453 is when he leaves Egypt to enter the promised land. It's all in the Bible. And then in 1 Kings 6, 1, it said it was 480 years to the day since the Exodus. So you can figure that out. And you know, this is a Shemitah year because it's divisible by seven. A speedy year is divisible by seven. When the temple was finished, they waited one year, it says, in 1 Kings 8, 2, to dedicate it. And then you can go on all the way down to the temple was destroyed in the year 3361. Okay? That's from Adam. A.M. Adam made. If we can't remember anything else, think of A.M. as Adam made. Okay, now... This is going to be interesting. Here we go. Here is the Middle East. <clears throat> We've got Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple there. And there's a verse that talked about how Solomon had a fleet of ships, okay, going everywhere. As a matter of fact, look at your notes in 1 Kings 9, 26. King Solomon built a fleet of ships, okay, uh, which is near Elot, which is down right in here. There's Elot down in there. Uh, and he had a, a fleet of ships, and it says, Hiram sent with, his, with the fleet his servants, some seamen who were familiar with the sea, together with the servants of Solomon. Okay, uh, well, Hiram, <coughs> Ooh, where am I? Okay, he's up in Lebanon. He's up there. All right, now look at 1 Kings 10, 24 and 25. The whole earth sought the presence of Solomon. Okay, now the whole earth doesn't mean people from America, all right, but it's talking all about the Mediterranean. All of those people 
were going to Solomon. And that's in 1 Kings 10, 24 and 25, to hear his wisdom that God put in his mind. And everyone is bringing all kinds of stuff. Now, in the year, first off, here is God's calendar. Year zero. Friday the 1st was the first day on the civil calendar. How do we know what was a Friday? Adam was created on the sixth day. Friday's the sixth day. That's Rosh Hashanah, Tishri 1. That's how we know that's when the calendar begins. And then we see Noah's flood in 1656. Uh, Abraham, okay, in 2023, it was on the 14th of Nisan that he received the promise. And then we have in 2453, Moses begins the religious calendar, which is like 1308 BC, but it was 2453 since creation. And then Solomon's temple was in 2940 AM, on our calendar is like 821 BC. But guess what happens? Here we have this fine Gentlemen, uh, let me finish this, uh, my notes here. In 2453, right here, 2453 is when God gave Moses a religious calendar. It doesn't do away with the civil calendar, just like we have January 1st, but we also have a school calendar. That doesn't do away with the other calendar. We have a calendar for taxes. Okay, there's all kinds of calendars where there was in Judaism as well. But here's the thing. Around, uh, well, in 2453, God gives the religious calendar. We have the Aaronic priesthood is given to the people. And then around 2940, uh, that is when Solomon has his temple, which is around 821. Well, guess what happens right after that? 70 years later, we have Romulus. And he decided to create the calendar that we're using today. Okay, and it was in 753 BC, and it was based totally upon the sun. Not a lunar solar calendar, but a solar calendar. Now, here's the deal about Romulus. He reigned until 716 BC, but he's the one who established the calendar that we're using. But guess what? He said there were only 10 months. All right, so... What do we have here? The 10 months were Martius, Aprilus, Maius, Junius, Quintilius, Sextilius, and then September is seven, right? October is eighth, November is the ninth, and December is a decade, it's 10. And there were only 10 months. So watch what happens with our wonderful calendar. Now, tradition has it that Romulus named the first month Martius after his own father, the god of war, he believed, Mars. Now, as a matter of fact, I want to throw this in. 2 Samuel 11, verse 1 says, In the spring of the year is the time when the kings go to battle. Well, guess what? Next spring is going to be the time when the kings are going to go to battle. Aprilus in Latin, we get April from, means an opening. Like the flowers are opening up. Maus refers to the goddess of fertility. Junius was the goddess of love and marriage. This is why people get married in June. Okay, this is where this comes from. So, what do we see? His next guy after him is Numa Pompilius in 17, 715 BC. But he decided that there should be 12 months. And so he added January and February, but February was the last month of the year, not December. I'm just kind of showing you how things unfold. Well, here's the problem. First off, with our calendar, you just had like 40 years missing two months. You just lost over six years in our calendar by them deciding to add the two months they never had before. So our calendar's already six years off because they counted it for 40 some years as only 10 months. So what happens, here we go. We have 3008 AM is 753 BC. And we have Romulus. Now comes Numa Pompilius in 715 BC, okay, is when he is. And he's making this change. But what does he do? He not only added January, February to the end of the year, 
Some say uh, that while well, Numa Pompilius is also credited with the establishment of the Roman religion with their own version of a priesthood. Why? He was one of those men who went over on the ships to see Solomon. And he saw, well, they got a calendar. We want a calendar. Oh, they got a priesthood. We want a priesthood too. And so he created the temple of Vesta, okay, in 715 B.C. Here he started. He said, we need a religion just like Solomon got. And so he creates a whole priesthood, including the Flamines, who were the high priests over 15 cults, these ladies, the Vestal Virgins, that's where this came from, who took care of the sacred flame in the temple of Vesta. The Salii were the dancing, jumping priests of Mars. The Fetiales are the priests who acted as envoys to avoid wars. And then they created the pontiffs, clear back then. And it was led by Pontifex Maximus, who was responsible for the most important religious decisions, including war and all of this. Okay? So different people held the title of Pontifex Maximus. So what do we find here? Now, boom, here we have Pontifex Maximus Julius Caesar in 45 BCE. And he decided we need to create a Julian calendar because things were getting messed up. And of course, this was in the year 37, 16 AM. And he said, this is crazy. We need to change the calendar. So January and February are at the beginning, not at the end. So he moved them around, okay? And that is how the number eight became the number 10. The number nine becomes 11. The seventh month, uh, September, becomes the ninth month. See, that's how it got all screwed up. This is when. That's why the numbers don't match anymore. That's our great calendar. Now, what he decided, he, Julius Caesar says, oh my goodness, Rome started 708 years ago. So he decided that on our calendar, 45 BC, that it was really 708 AUC, which is ab urbe condita, or the founding of Rome. So out of the blue, he says, okay, this first year of my kingdom is going to be the year 708 from when Rome was founded. And then he says, matter of fact, I'm going to get rid of Quintilius and call it July after me, Julius Caesar. And then comes Caesar Augustus in 37, 53, and he says, we're going to change Sextilis to August after me. So you're getting an idea of where our calendar is coming from. Okay, so August, Augustus Caesar, it was now in 745 AUC, which was 8 BC. But how do you know the people back then didn't know it was 8 BC? Okay, all they knew is that it was 745 AUC. But all the Jewish people knew it was 3753 since Adam. Nothing's changed. Okay, so now what happens? Let's go to our little calendar here. Okay, you've already kind of seen this. This is 2933 is when Solomon began to build the temple. And 3361, as we saw, that's when the temple was destroyed. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Okay, oh, over here, I have uh, 3716, which was 45 BC, which was now 708 AUC. And that is uh, when uh, we have Romulus right in here. Right in here, it was uh, in 753 BC, it was the year 3008, that's when Rome was find, founded by Romulus. So Rome was founded by Romulus, and then comes uh, Numa Pompilius, okay, and then down here is Julius Caesar, and then Caesar Augustus, okay, and then what happens? In 3900 from Adam, which we call 140 AD, there's a rabbi, Halafta, and he announces, this is the year it's supposed to be from Adam, okay? Well, what happens? Of course, nobody likes the Jewish people. In 4044 after man, it's 284 AD on our calendar, but you know, well, let me tell you the next one. It's now the 1037th from the foundation of Rome. There's a new Roman emperor named Diocletian. 
And he says, forget all this, we're starting over. It's 1 AD after me, Agnus Diocletian. So everyone in the Roman Empire now knew it as the year 1. But it was 708 or 1037 from the founding of Rome. And so what happens? Okay, here's Diocletian who hated everybody. He was one of the worst emperors in the world, one of the biggest anti-Semites. And so he starts the year Anno Diocletian. Well, what happens at the first council of Nicaea? Here we go. 325 AD. It's now the year 1078 from the founding of Rome. The year 4085 from Adam, but it's now 41st year of Anno Diocletian. Now, everyone's familiar with, uh, like, Constantine around 325. Did you know everyone who lived in the year 325 did not know it was the year 325? It hadn't been created yet. The only AD was the year of Diocletian, not after the death or year of our Lord, our news day. So everyone in that day knew it as either the 1078th year of Rome or they knew it as the 41st year of Anno Diocletian. They didn't know anything else. And so think when they made all these rulings around Constantine, they didn't know what year it was other than the Roman year or the year of Diocletian. Well, so then what happens? In the year 532 AD, of course, they didn't know it was 532 AD, which was 4285 from the creation, we have another man named Dionysius. And he is in 247th year of Anno Diocletian. And he declares, here he is, there's a nice little picture of him. Of course, he's Catholic. And he decides, we need to pick a year for the Lord's birth. So he, it wasn't until 532 AD that they came up with an Agnus Day year of our Lord. And he had no idea when Yeshua was born. He just, you know, tried to figure it out. Okay, so then what happens? In the year 4491 from the birth of the Lord, which is now 731 AD, according to him, we have another man named Bede, and he decided, well, we need to create a BC. So he's the one who comes up with BC, and a nice little Catholic man. And that, it wasn't until the year 730, 31 that they even decided to come up with a BC and he tried to figure out when was creation. Okay. And let me see. Ah, da, da. Yeah, at the first council of Nicaea in 8325, they noticed the problem that the northern spring equinox was occurring well before the March 21st date. And this date was important to the Christian churches back in the year 300 because it is fundamental to the calculation for their date of Easter. They decided that Easter would always fall on a Sunday following the full moon that follows the spring equinox. That's how they came up with the date of Easter. And it wasn't until 200 years later in 525 that it was a monk named uh, Dionysius Exiguus, who introduced the AD system. And then uh, it wasn't even widely used, though, until the 9th century. And the addition of BC component happened 200 years after Dionysius, when the venerable Bede of Northumbria, which is England and Scotland, published his history of the English people in 731. Bede's work not only brought the AD system to the attention of other scholars, they even weren't even aware of an AD system in the 700s, but also expanded the system to include the years before AD. Okay, to Bede, though, he also was ignorant of the number zero. So the year that came before 1 AD was 1 BC. And there is no year zero on either side. So there, they are missing two more years. There was, because zero didn't exist back then. There was still a problem, though. The Julian year was too long by 11 minutes and 14 seconds. This may not seem like a lot, but after 1,000 years, it adds up to one day per every 100 years. 
And it was not until in the 16th century that Vernal Enoch was falling around March 11th instead of March 21st. And so what happens? We have Pope Gregory. And he adds 11 days to the calendar. There's Pope Gregory. But the problem is... That was only for Catholics. All the Protestants thought this was a Catholic plot, so they ignored it. And uh, during this time, Lightfoot, he decided that creation started in 3929. That's what he said. Creation was in 3929. Well, then what happens? Then we get Usher, who says, no, sir, it's in 4004. Well, okay. So then what happens? In 1752, the United States, 1752, the United States and the Brits finally accept the Gregorian calendar, and they add 12 days to the calendar. Okay? What do we notice about these? They're all man-made. That's our calendar. So here, the Julian calendar was in 1582 in October. It went from Thursday the 4th to Friday the 15th. Then... Right there, Thursday the 4th, Friday the 15th, on the Gregorian calendar. Well, here now, King George says, okay, fine, we're going to add 12 days. And so, in 1752, Wednesday the 2nd was followed by Thursday the 14th. All right, so uh, you can see that there. Julian to Gregorian. The Catholics did Julian to Gregorian in 1582, and they're, oops, let me go back. And so, again, what is the problem with all of these? Okay, um, I'm skipping some things. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? I think I have 15 minutes. Okay, so, Jeremiah 8, 7 says, The stork in heaven knows her appointed times, And the turtle dove and the crane and the swallow observe their appointed times. But my people are clueless. They don't know which way to go. They don't know. Do they go B.C.? Do they go A.D.? Well, why not just stick with the Bible and just go straight on? All right. Here's the thing. Jeremiah 10, 23. I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in the man who walks to even to direct his steps. Okay, we are clueless. We are all born with a broken compass and we are all born with a broken watch. And so God has to direct our steps. So here's believers. We are lost in space. We are lost in time. We've lost our connection because we're on the wrong calendar. All right. Genesis 1.14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them, notice it's them, not just the sun, not just the moon, but them. And the number one reason is for what? Signs. The sun and the moon. Eclipses are his signs in heaven. Who would know or care about eclipses using only a lunar calendar or only a solar calendar? We need to be on God's biblical calendar because that's the real one that has to do with eternity. Yes, our calendar is important to do business, but don't try to make the true calendar fit somewhere on the Gregorian calendar. We got to make the Gregorian calendar fit on the, the real calendar, if anything. So it's not like the Jewish calendar is missing years. No, the Gregorian calendar has it all screwed up. So coming back, we need to know what time it is. Now, If I ask what time is it, and we're supposed to know the times and seasons, how long is the time? Well, we know about the times of the Gentiles. Well, how long is that? We also know about a time, times, and a half a time, which is three and a half years. But how can you know what time it is if you know how long a time is in the context? So um, let me help you, everybody, here. We always think of morning and evening as a day. But that is not how it works. No, no, no. It's evening and morning is the first day. Now, so this is when the first day begins. The second day begins, evening and morning. Does everyone see that? Okay, so 
is 2024 in the 20th century or the 21st? It's exactly, it's in the 21st. As a matter of fact, you're 24, or you're, yeah, 24 years into the 21st century. So is uh, 150 AD in the first or second century? 150 is in the second century, okay? Because when do you become a year old? When you're born or after the first year? Okay, so if you're 1.5, you're halfway into the second century. Everyone has to get that. This is so important because there's the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. Do you notice when you turn five, you've entered the sixth day or sixth year? As soon as you turn five, because that's at the end. So the second day, you say you're five years old, but you're really five years in a day or five years and six months. Now, here's why this is important. Here we go. These are thousand year day now. When you turn five, you've entered the sixth day and the sixth day ends over there. Is everyone following me? Okay, you have to get this. This is gonna be mind blowing. Okay, so if we are in the year 5784 right now, right? We are 784 years into the sixth day. We're about to enter the seventh day. Is everyone following me? Five means you hit five. You're now in the sixth year. You're now, we are now 740 years into the sixth day. And if you remember, when does the Shabbat begin? Friday night. The seventh day doesn't begin at 7,000. It begins at sunset of the sixth day day. So we are 784 years into the sixth day. The seventh day begins at sunset of the sixth day. Well, guess what? <clears throat> Based on a 24-hour day, halfway would be what? 12 hours, which would be noon. Does that make sense? Okay. And if you divide 24 by four, you get six, which means every six hours is a quarter. Therefore, if you're at three quarters of the day, it would be 6 p.m. or 1800 military time. Is everyone following me? Well, you take 24 times the 0.784 that were here. We are at 18.8 or 6.48 p.m. is where we're at on a six day, 24 hour clock. 6 p.m. is 1800. 7 p.m. is 1900. Does everyone understand that? Well, guess what? 5784 is 784, which we see is 648, which puts us right there at 7 p.m. This of the seventh day, has it begun? Is it sunset yet of the sixth day? October 3rd of this next year, Tishri 1, sunset in Jerusalem is... 620, so we've entered the seventh day now. Let me go back. Let me do it. Oh. So anyway, let me, the seventh day, guys, has already begun. We are at sunset of the sixth day. We're entering the seventh day. We are in the seventh day. Now, concerning a jubilee, Leviticus 25, 8, you're to number seven Sabbaths of years, right? Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you how many? What's seven times seven? Okay, so God has us count 49-year blocks. So here is one through seven, and here is one through seven, which is 49. Okay, these are the Shemitah, uh, these are the first year of a new Shemitah cycle. These are the Shemitah years. Okay, so there's your seven by seven. It's a block of years. And the 49th year is always followed by what? The 50th year. Wow, look how math works. So here's what happens. They are 49-year blocks, and the Jubilee is always the first year of the next 49-year cycle. It's not a separate year. God did not say throw in a separate year. He just says the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. So the year of Jubilee 
is the first year after a block of 49. Now, some people would have you believe that 1917, 1967, and 2017 were all Jubilee years because they're 50 years apart. Well, I'll have you know that is impossible. I call it math. Here we are. Here is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Here is the seventh year of a Shemitah cycle. And everyone knows this was a Shemitah year. 2014, 2015 was a Shemitah year. 2007, 2008 was a Shemitah year. How do we know? Well, if you take this year, 5740, and divide it by seven, you get 820. You know it's a Shemitah year because the Hebrew year is divisible by seven. And so the next one is 821. The next one is 822. What do you think the top one would be if I divide it by seven? Ta-da! 819. It's just math. They're all divisible by seven, and each seven uh, will move up. Now, Jubilee cycles, we saw are seven times seven or 49 years, right? 49 years. How do we know? This is a 10-year Shemitah cycle. How do we know where the first year of a Shemitah cycle is? When is the Jubilee? Well, guess what? You take 5733, it's, we know it's divisible by seven, but it's got to be divisible by 49. Well, guess what it is? It's 117, therefore 1973, which is when the Yom Kippur year was, was a jubilee year. That's right, because it's every 49 years. The 50th year is always the first year of the next cycle. Okay, so it's like a pillbox. You can't peel off one day. It comes in the whole section. Okay, so if that is the first year of a jubilee year, that's the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, the seventh one. So if that's the seventh, that means this is going to be what? A jubilee year. And that's what it was. It was a jubilee year. We can test it. Is this year, 5782, divisible by 49? Okay, it is. It's 118. Shazam. If you use math, you know when every Shemitah cycle is. You know where Jubilee years, and I have it clear back to creation. I just continued the AMs. Now, 2016 or 2017 cannot be a Jubilee year. Number one, God doesn't use 2017. He doesn't use the pagan calendar. Not only that, half of it is here and half of it is there. If you say 2017 is a Jubilee year, you got to ask, well, which one? The first half or the second half? Well, it's neither because it's in the middle of a Shemitah cycle. It's impossible for 2017 to be a jubilee year, but using simple basic math, how could 2017 be a jubilee year when it's in the middle of a Shemitah cycle? God doesn't use the Gregorian calendar year. He uses the Hebrew year. And the jubilee has to smart after, start after a Shemitah year. And it's not after a Shemitah year. So I got three minutes. We have to hurry. Okay, so here... 1972 to 1973, we go by December 31st, January 1st, right? And so this is one long year, and then we have 1974, New Year's Eve. Everyone understanding that calendar. Well, guess what? 5732 to 5733 doesn't start on January 1st, okay? It was September 8th, September 9th uh, on our calendar, 26th, 27th, 16th, and 17th, but it's all Arab Rosh Hashanah. All of the Hebrew years start on Rosh Hashanah. So here is the year 5733. Here is the year 5734. And what do we find? 5733 is divisible by seven. So guess what? That's a Shemitah year. Oh my goodness, what else do we see? It's also divisible by 49. That means that's the 117th year of Jubilee. Amazing how that works. Okay. Leviticus 25, 9 and 10, you will sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month, and that is not July. Okay. On October 6th, you declare the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. That's the 10th day. Guess what happened on the very first day of the year of Jubilee? We had the Yom Kippur War. The Jubilee cycle began the very first day with the Yom Kippur War. So here we go. Now, this was the last Jubilee cycle from 73 to 2023, the 10th day of the seventh month on the Day of Atonement there to sound it. In 73, it happened to be a Shabbat when the very first day of the year of Jubilee was proclaimed. 
And so, first day, year of Jubilee, Tishri 10, what do we have? The Yom Kippur War. Now, what happens? On the Shabbat, again, and notice October 7th, it's like the very next day, even though it's 50 years later, and it's on a Shabbat again, the very last day, Shemini Atzeret Semkat Torah, the closing day of that year of Jubilee, we have a war that just started. It began on the very first day with the war. It ends on the very last day with the war, which means this Jubilee cycle was very significant. Now, going back, like I said, Jacob was born in the year of Jubilee, representing Israel, and he died in the year of Jubilee. And then again, God made the signs in the heavens, all right? And these are signs that can't be manipulated by false prophets. These are signs understood by every tribe, nation, and tongue. And he made them for signs, okay? And seasons, which is Moedim, which means divine appointments, holy days, Shemitah years, Jubilee years. Now, those of you that have read my book that I wrote, I knew about in 2008, as a matter of fact, there were these solar lunar eclipses that were nigh impossible to happen and everyone was trying to figure out what they meant. And a lot of people decided they knew what it meant. And they said that this is what Mark Biltz meant. That's not what I meant. I told everybody I have no clue. Okay. But I knew it had significance. Well, guess what? I've shrunk our Jubilee cycle. What do I know happened? 2014, 2015 were the solar lunar eclipses that happened exactly seven years before the end of the Jubilee. The other Jubilee cycle... The solar lunar eclipse has happened exactly seven years before it began. And so there was also the 1967 war. So next week, I'm going to tell you all about the signs in the heavens and what they mean. So I ran out of time. So you're, we're going to go over this. But you can understand the Gregorian calendar is not to calendar if you're concerned with God. I talked about some of it last week about I began it and I'm going to end it next week. So you want to come back next week because you, if you are blown away today, it'll be nothing like next shot. So let's stand. But get ready. This is, this is prophecy that's coming to pass next year. I'm telling you. Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for everything you're doing in all of our lives. We know you're the one who calls the people and it's up to each one of us to respond to your call. And you've called your kids, the ones that want to hear your voice, to hear your voice, to listen to the Torah. It's all said in the Torah. It's all there. So I pray, Lord, you would lighten each one of us, enlighten us, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, Father, that we can share these things with your loved ones. And we're just so grateful that not only you want to bless us, but you want to put your name upon us even as you told Aaron to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Vishmareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka, Yisa Adonai Panavileka Vyasem, Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in that most wonderful name. Eyeh, Asher, Eyeh. Amen.